Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Last time we added the new geometry component for the editor and made sure that it handles uploading and unloading of the mesh data to and from the engine. The component is also saved along with its game entity in the project file. However, in order to save the list of materials, we need to make sure that applied materials can also be serialized. As we know, applied materials are not regular assets that can be saved in an asset file, despite inheriting from the asset base class. So we need to save them in a project file. That means that we need to serialize the relevant data members, such as input asset IDs and surface properties. Let's start with inputs. When a material has an input, that means that the shaders in that material require an index in order to get the shader resource view from the descriptor heap and sample from that resource. Therefore, it also means that the input can't be null and must point to a valid resource. In order to do that, all inputs will use a default texture when they are first initialized. The user then can set the appropriate texture asset for each input in the editor. In default assets class, we add a new property for the default texture. We also create an array of these default assets in order to register them later in the asset registry. The default texture is not created here, so we only have to load its asset info using a path. This path reminds me of a little fix I had to do in new project class. Although this also works, this is the correct path. Okay, so now let me import our default texture. You can use any square image that you want for this. I use a small 64 by 64 pixel image imported in BC7 format. Obviously, this wouldn't be right for an input like a normal map, but let's start simple. I'll copy this asset file to the resources folder in the editor's project. So I just made a new folder here for default assets. These files need to be copied to the installation location of the editor. We already did a similar thing for project templates. Now we do the same for default assets. Of course, we have to select the correct build configuration for the editor if we want the files to be copied to the right location. I still can't see the file though. Oh, it was copied, but the file explorer was being crappy and didn't refresh. So now we have all default assets in one place. We add a static property to the texture asset class to get the default texture. By the way, make sure to disable the code for exporting binaries for the test project. Now we can use this default texture for material inputs. When the user assigns a new asset, we need to unload the previous asset and upload the new one to the engine. In the load method, we only upload the asset if it wasn't already uploaded. And we only unload an asset if it was already uploaded. When an input is created with a specific asset, it will be used right away, otherwise the default asset will be used. 
Going back to the topic of serialization, we need to add a data contract attribute to classes that needs to be serialized. We also add data member attributes to any properties or fields that need to be saved. I'll rewrite this method to modify its parameter instead of returning a new instance. Next, we add this attribute to the applied material class, which is referred to in the geometry component. Let's also make this thread safe since I'm going to create geometry components asynchronously. The lock class is new in .NET 9 and has a better performance than using a lock object. So I'm going to replace all our lock objects with this one. By the way, always make sure that the lock objects are defined as a static field when you're protecting static data. Otherwise, each instance will have its own lock, which is obviously of no use. Going back to Applied Material class, we need to save the material asset GUI. This is the asset file containing the shaders and input names, among others. In addition, we save the input asset GUIs and their names. I'm not sure if we have to save input names, since we can get them from the material asset, but I'll do it anyway in case we decide they should be editable separately for each applied material. I'd also like to add a name for each applied material. So we add a property here that is also saved with the project. Finally, the material surface properties are also saved. Let's give the material a default name and make the setter for these properties private so that we can initialize them during deserialization. Here we need to add the material to the dictionary if it wasn't added before. Then everywhere we access any of our static data, we have to use the lock in order to prevent race conditions from happening. When uploading the material, we first upload input assets, then the shaders and finally the material itself. The inputs are unloaded after the material and the shaders. Also note that I changed the scope of these lines, which need to happen when an applied material is unloaded. Again, we use a lock here as well, and since the content ID in uploaded asset property is set to invalid when its ref count becomes zero, we need to remember the ID in order to remove it from our dictionary. I'm going to make a new method for this block of code where we either set the material field if the asset was already loaded or read the asset file if it wasn't. This method will also be called when the project is being loaded. So we're gonna have to write serialization methods, but that means that some of these fields and properties can't be read-only since we are going to assign values to them in a method that's not the constructor. Starting with unserializing, we need to set the values for fields that are saved. These are the material GUI, input asset GUI, and input names. Next is the undeserialized method. While writing this, I realized that the serializer doesn't call the class constructor for creating an instance of the class, which means that the asset type won't be set through this hardcoded constructor parameter, and since it's a read-only property of the asset base class, it can't be set in the serialization method either. So the only two options are either to add a setter for this property, or add a data contract to asset base class.
I chose the latter because I don't want to enable changing asset types, which could lead to problems. So we only add a data member attribute for the asset type here and make it private set so the serializer can set its value. While we are here, I'm going to convert this assertion into an exit condition. Also make this method shorter. The asset class is an abstract class and therefore can't be instantiated, but I'll also make its constructor protected anyway. Now I see this uploaded asset class and I remember that we are going to upload the assets asynchronously and that means that we need to make this class thread safe as well. So I'll add another lock here and where we access the static uploaded assets dictionary, I'm going to protect it with this lock. Or in other words, we are synchronizing access to this field. Okay, let's go back to our serialization method in applied material where we can try to get the asset info for the material. We use the default material if it couldn't be found. Next, we construct the array of inputs. For now, we assume that inputs can only have textures, so if an input asset couldn't be found, we attach the default texture. Finally, we initialize other fields and properties. I think this is all we need in order to properly save the geometry component in the project file. Next I'd like to make uploading shaders thread safe as well. So here we add a lock object and use it everywhere we access these static dictionaries. There is also an issue with unloading shader groups from the engine, and in order to fix that, we need a reference to the uploaded shader group. Therefore, we add a new private field here. We set it when the shader group is uploaded. And in the unload method, we use the reference count instead of this check. Okay, so far we added everything needed for representing a geometry component in the editor. However, we also need to send this information to the engine in order to actually create a game entity with a geometry component. Therefore, we need to add a class in engine API to contain this information. All we need to pass to the engine is the uploaded geometry ID, the number of materials and the array of material IDs. This is the C# -sharp counterpart of the init info struct that we have here, which is used when a game entity is created. We need a default constructor for entities that don't have a geometry component, and another one for setting the required information when there is a geometry component. Geometry content ID and material count can be set directly, but we need to allocate a buffer and copy the material IDs. We add a new property in the game entity descriptor for the geometry component. When we are creating a game entity, if there is a geometry component, we'll set the descriptor accordingly. 
Let me also add a lock here to synchronize this, but I'm probably going to handle that differently later, so feel free to leave it as is. Next, we need to receive this information in the C++ side. This is rather straightforward, as you can see here. Now when I want to create an empty game entity, we get this assertion failure where it's trying to create a geometry component while it shouldn't, because it's an empty game entity. The reason that it's trying to add one is that geometry init info is not null and has a content ID with a value of zero, which is a valid ID. So when we don't have a geometry component, we have to initialize it to an invalid ID and set the geometry init info to a null pointer when this ID is invalid. Okay, now we can add and remove empty game entities again. Today we finished the backend that offers the basic functionality to just add a geometry component with a mesh asset that uses the default material. In the next episode, we are going to work on the user interface in order to enable the user to create game entities with a geometry component and assign any mesh assets to those game entities. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.